Yes. So hello everyone. Yeah, this is the advanced section hosted by Rayo. And maybe we can start with Rayo briefly introduce yourself and the talk. Yeah, it's your uh, state now. Okay, thanks. So I'll, so my name is Rayo. I'm from Finland. Uh, and it's pretty late here. It's 9 p.m. currently. So let's hope I don't fall asleep during the lecture. But <laughs> uh, so I'm currently a first year PhD student at uh, Tampere University. Uh, and I am, so my research is on mathematical logic. And since, well, I have some logic background, it made sense to keep a presentation on Gödel's incompleteness theorems because I, I know that this is a topic that uh, everybody knows something about and it seems to be a very interesting topic to many people. So I thought that it uh, would be worthwhile to try to also explain some of the mathematics behind it. Uh, because uh, from a certain point of view, it's the background mathematics are not that complicated. Okay, so so I guess I will now start uh, properly. So the title of the talk is uh, or the lecture is undecidability of the halting problem and Gödel's incompleteness theorems. So I will actually start by just recalling Gödel's uh, first incompleteness theorem. So this is a slightly informal version. Uh, which is saying that if I have some consistent set of axioms, which I denote by T, uh, whose theorems uh, I can enumerate by a Turing machine, then this theorem is saying, th saying that uh, there are necessarily going to be true statements about natural numbers that uh, cannot be deduced from T. And so one way to think about this is that it's saying that uh, number theory or mathematics more generally cannot be automatized because uh, if I have, a, if, so if, for example, if I want to study number theory and I set up some set of axioms uh, that I'm studying, uh, if these axioms are so strong that they, every uh, true statement about natural numbers can be deduced from them, then there can't not be a Turing machine, which could basically replace me, who is proving all the theorems. And what is informal in this statement is, of course, that I have not specified really what a theorem is, what a statement is, what a deduction is, what is an axiom. I mean, of course, uh, we all have some intuitive idea about what they mean, but to really turn this incompleteness theorem into a mathematically precise theorem, you have to specify formally what those mean. And that's going to actually be one of the main things that we're going to focus on this lecture. So, so, let's, so I'll start with some brief historical background just to sort of set up the scene and maybe argue why this, these incompleteness theorems were such a big deal, and in a sense, they are, still are. And here's a nice quote by von Neumann, who was also a very famous mathematician. And well, yeah, I mean, it, it seems to give you this <laughs> impression that, yeah, these were quite a big result. Uh, so why was this the case? So if we go to the start of the 20th century, this is when Hilbert started to tell other mathematicians what you should study. And one of his problems was the proof that arithmetic is consistent. And there was this additional requirement that this proof should only use purely uh, finite, finitistic methods. And of course, with, I mean, with a lot of the, uh, Pro Hilbert's problems, they were not really that well specified. So for example, what does finitistic mean, but, or what is really arithmetic, <clears throat> but what he was, so one way of interpreting this problem is saying that, okay, uh, 
we'll choose some nice set of axioms for arithmetic. Uh, there were such axiomatizations developed around the time. And let's try to prove that it's consistent by using some proof system which is weaker uh, in a sense than the arithmetical theory itself. And why were we people interested in this? Well, there is a lot of, I mean, there's a lot of, lot of historical background that I can't cover here, but basically this all started from the basic uh, paradoxes that started to arise in set theory and people were starting to worry that maybe mathematics is contradictory and so on. So what Hilbert basically is suggesting that, okay, let's somehow axiomatize all the fields. Let's start with number theory. Uh, and then let's try to prove that it's consistent by using something that is uh, weaker than the arithmetic or, or number theory. Uh, and preferably, be, <laughs> we want to prove the consistency by using something that with, which we can prove to be consistent. And this is some, so, so two goals, to prove that arithmetic is consistent and you know, to also provide some nice axiomatic uh, foundation for many fields of mathematics. And this is basically what Gödel showed that is not possible. So, so in the 1930s, he proved his incompleteness theorems. And so the first one we already mentioned, the second one basically says that if you have a sufficiently strong uh, axiomatic system, then it's not possible, possible to prove within this system that it's consistent. And so this is kind of problematic in the sense that, okay, let's say I want to create some axiomatic foundation for all of, all of mathematics. Uh, sorry, I have a dog here. Uh, so if you want to prove an axiomatic foundation for all of mathematics, then proving that it's consistent is also a mathematical statement. Uh, but Goethe's second incompleteness theorem says that there is no such proof. So it's basically just showing that mathematics is going, to, if it's really consistent, then we will never basically know it. Um, but, and so already in his, uh, in these uh, early versions of incompleteness theorems, uh, there were some form of uh, notion of computability already involved because this is somehow, this is again related to Hilbert's own philosophy of mathematics, which is this formalism. So, you know, it's proofs are objective because they're purely syntactical or mechanical. And uh, so Gödel tried to formalize this somehow using notion of some sort of notion of computability, but he actually didn't uh, formalize what is a computable function by then. And this was done then later independently by, well, actually by many people, uh, but including Gödel himself, Church and Turing. And they basically all introduced different models of computation. Uh, Gödel introduced recursive functions, Church uh, introduced lambda calculus and Turing introduced Turing machines. And sort of, I, I, I think that it's fair to say that only after we had some intuitive notion of computation, uh, which basically Turing provided, because out of all the known models of computation, Turing machines are arguably the most intuitive ones in the sense that it, we somehow seem to agree that they really capture computation. And so only after somehow this church Turing thesis was mentioned, uh, I think it gave some extra weight to Gödel's incompleteness theorems. And right, so it, it really, so I, I would say that the incompleteness theorems of Gödel are important because we have this notion of, uh, we have this church Turing thesis, which really tells us, uh, or somehow it formalizes what computation means. Okay. And so that's, a very brief background. Uh, I'd suggest that if, if you find this interesting, you should definitely look up more, but there's a lot of stuff to cover there. Okay. So now we'll actually move to the real topic of this talk, which is the 
which is basically, so I said that we are going to formalize some of the notions that are involved in Gödel's first incompleteness theorem, but uh, we're actually also going to sketch how to prove Gödel's first incompleteness theorem. And here is a, I think th this is a nice, or Leonid Levin here is putting it quite nicely, what's the real mathematical content of Gödel's first incompleteness theorem. And it's, it's this uh, sentence that I have bolded here. So, uh, so he's referring in it to Gödel's proof. And he's saying that the mathematical essence uh, of Gödel's proof is the absence of total recursive extensions of universal partial recursive predicate, which is uh, a slightly complicated way of saying that the essence is basically the fact that there are non-computable functions. Um, so this is actually not uh, how Gödel himself originally uh, presented it, partially, I, I guess, because he really didn't have a good uh, notion of computability. And his own proof was based on this uh, quite interesting observation that if you, and which was very novel at the time, uh, which is that if you have a somehow a sufficiently strong axiomatic theory, then you can actually speak about, uh, so in this you, you can speak about deductions uh, that you can do using these axioms and you have some set of formal rules you can formalize these deductions within the theory itself. So there is a very strong notion of self referentially And it, it's helpful, I think it's helpful uh, and instructive to compare this to the way how, for example, we can use Turing machines to reason about the behavior of other Turing machines because we can just encode Turing machines as binary strings and then uh, feed them to other Turing machines. So it's, there is, I think it's kind of analogous the way the self-referentiality works here. And, but okay, um, so Gödel had his own proof, but there is also this alternative way of proving this Gödel's first incompleteness theorem, uh, which is that, uh, which is just based on the fact that the halting problem of Turing machine is undecidable. So it's so this version of the proof or this proof uh, somehow takes uh, somehow makes it very formal that it is indeed the undecidability of the halting problem. Or I guess it's fair to say that in general it's it's the fact that there are non-computable functions which implies the Gödel's incompleteness first incompleteness theorem and uh i think that it's i think th i i like this proof a bit better because well first it's somehow it's more uh accessible and secondly it really formalizes somehow that uh, that or makes it formal that somehow or it somehow demonstrates that uh, limits of computability imply or enforce limits on how we can do mathematics. And I think that's kind of interesting. And so, as I've already indicated, the purpose of this lecture is to formalize, and here put formalize in quotes, uh, one variant of Gödel's first incompleteness theorem. And then I will sketch you uh, how to prove it using using just the fact that the halting problem of Turing machines is undecidable. So I guess what I can do now is to check the. Uh, okay, so you have been answering questions well, good. Okay, so I'll continue. So, as I said, uh, what we really need to formalize uh, in Gödel's first incomplete test theorem. Is, is these words, what, what are these theorems, statements, axioms? Uh, and well, one way of formalizing is then is that, okay, well, let's, let's first think of them as being just sentences of number theory uh, or, or sentences from the language that number theorists use 
Okay, so let's try to think about this language in a more formal way. Uh, and that's what we're basically going to do. So we need to define some formal language. And uh, one standard choice for this formal language is the first row logic. I should mention that you can formulate uh, Goethe's first incompleteness theorem in a much more abstract way. So this is actually still quite concrete. But uh, first of all, it has uh, several good properties. Plus, uh, if you know what uh, this Z ZFC is, then you know that its axioms are sentences of first of all logic. So it's in that sense, it's, it's pretty sufficient as a logic. Uh, and so I don't know how much people are actually familiar with logic, but Basically, when you define a logic, you need to do two things. So you need to define its syntax. So this is just saying that what strings are actually sentences of this logic. And then you have semantics, which then tell us the, how the sentences of the logic are uh, supposed to be interpreted over, over mathematical structures. Okay. So, so we'll start with the syntax. And to define the syntax, uh, so a, a key ingredient in a syntax is uh, some sort of a vocabulary, which is simply a, some set of non-logical symbols. I'll make this more concrete very soon. Uh, so in our vocabularies, we will have certain constant symbols and function symbols. Uh, so we are interested in formalizing the language that uh, number theorists use. So we will be working with the following vocabulary. So we have, um, we have four symbols. Uh, so we have this zero symbol. This is a constant. And then we have these three function symbols, uh, S, and then we have this addition and multiplication. So uh, yeah, it, there is a pretty clear, uh, I, we have pretty clear idea of what the intended interpretations should be for these symbols. But for now, uh, they are just symbols. And uh, so keep that in mind. So I think in, in logic, what you need to be careful with is to clearly uh, distinguish syntax and semantics. So this is just syntax so far. Okay. And so we have this vocabulary. Uh, and in addition, we're going to need some infinite set of variables. Okay, let's take some x, y, z, some standard variable symbols. And then we're going to have some logical symbols. So here we have uh, some Boolean connectives. So negation, conjunction, disjunction, implication. And then we have, uh, since we are working in first of logic, we have two quantifiers, uh, the existence of quantifier and the universal quantifier. And uh, okay, so how do we, so now we're going to discuss how uh, we are going to form sentences of first logic. So basically we have three steps. So first, uh, so we had our vocabulary, our non-logical symbols. Uh, let's say we focus on the case where the vocabulary is the vocabulary of arithmetic, then we can combine these with uh, variables that we have picked and to form uh, things called terms. So for example, X plus Y is a term and S of zero is a term. And then uh, now that we have some terms, we can form equations. So again, so here's a concrete example. So X plus Y equals uh, X, times, X times Y and uh, these terms, uh, or these, sorry, these equations are more generally called atomic formulas. So these are, so this is an atomic formula of first row logic over the vocabulary of arithmetic. Uh, and then you can build more complex formulas uh, by, uh, com so you have these atomic formulas and then you combine them with these uh, logical symbols. So let me give you some examples. 
because I have not really defined the syntax here formally. Uh, so, but I, I prefer to keep it uh, slightly informal. You know, yeah, so keep the style slightly informal. So, uh, so here are some example uh, strings, which are sentences of first logic over the vocabulary of arithmetic. So, for example, here what we have done is that we have started with the equation x plus y equals y plus x, and then we just uh, appended two universal quantifiers here. Okay, and then uh, here's a more complicated sentence of first order logic. So we have started, so we have some equations here. Uh, here we have used the shorthand notation. Uh, and then we, well, I mean, I guess it's quite self-explanatory what is happening here, but just to give you some examples. And, and here's a third example. So I think this already should give you a pretty good idea on what the syntax is. Uh, uh, okay, yeah. Okay, so that's the syntax. And so now, that, now we <laughs> know basically what sentences of first logic are. Uh, now we can uh, discuss semantics of first logic. So more generally, what is the purpose of semantics for a logic? Well, or more generally for a formal language, well, it's basically saying that uh, it, it's the semantics will tell us uh, when a uh, given sentence is true uh, in some structure. So what is a structure? Uh, so that needs to be defined. So and this is kind of an important concept. So remember that we had this vocabulary, uh, which contained some non-logical symbols, which didn't have any, you know, we didn't give any interpretation for these non-logical symbols. So that's actually up to the structure to do. So the structure will tell us how it interpretates those non-logical symbols. So it basically gives them meaning. Uh, so as an example, so again, we have this vocabulary of arithmetic. Uh, and here is a structure which is uh, interpreting these symbols from, the, from this vocabulary. So e each structure has some domain. Uh, which is basically the set of elements that we are talking about. So, uh, in this, so this is the standard. This is called the standard structure of uh, arithmetic, and as its domain is well, as you would expect, the set of natural numbers. And then we had the four non-logical symbols, and they are interpreted in the stru standard structure in the standard way. So, for example. The uh, addition symbol will be interpreted as the standard addition of natural numbers. And multiplication will be interpreted as the standard uh, multiplication of natural numbers. And, and this zero, which was a constant, because it was a constant, it will be interpreted as a single element. And in the standard structure, it will be interpreted as uh, zero. Uh, yeah, okay, there was a good question on the parentheses. So I was actually, so when I was defining the syntax, I was a bit careless about the parentheses uh, on purpose. But yeah, if you if you define the uh, syntax really formally, then you have parentheses everywhere. And then you, and then it's of course not clear that say some of the parentheses can be removed. So I will uh, say some, so, Actually, I think, okay. Yeah, I'll say something about it soon. Uh, so, okay, so this is so these are structures. Actually, I could also say another example. So if you're familiar with uh, groups, for example, then you can basically think uh, group uh, as a structure. It has a different vocabulary than the vocabulary of arithmetic. Uh, it, it contains, for example, a symbol for the group operator, 
and different groups interpretate group operators in a different way. So if you have the uh, standard additive uh, group of integers, then the group operator will be you know, interpreted as the addition of integers. And if you have some matrix group, it will be interpreted as probably as a matrix multiplication. Okay. So again, I will not really specify the semantics of first law logic, but it's it's kind of it's very natural. So uh, even the formal definition is kind of silly because what it does is it just basically translates sentences of first law logic into English or Finnish or whatever. Uh, and then there is this. Uh, okay, so just a piece of notation. So if I have some sentence and some structure. Uh, and this sentence is true in this structure, then I'll just denote it by this. So I'll just, uh, so this is something, this notion of truth that I want to dwell in a bit. So I'll carefully go through the three examples that we discussed earlier. So uh, first, uh, so here was the sentence which is, yeah, I mean, if you're familiar with quantifiers, you have seen them before, then you sort of see that, ah, okay, this. This is saying that uh, addition of uh, this addition is uh, commutative, and this sentence is indeed true in the standard structure of natural numbers. Uh, and let me just really carefully explain it. Uh, so, so let me read it out loud. So it's saying that for any x, and since the domain is the set of natural numbers, this x will be interpreted as a natural number. So it's saying that for any natural number x and for any natural number y, we have that x plus y equals y plus x. And this is true because we interpreted this addition as the standard addition of natural numbers. Okay. And here's another example, uh, which is basically expressing a special case of uh, Fermat's last theorem. And so let me point out here. So yeah, uh, all the parentheses, uh, most of the parentheses are missing here. So if you would want to be like super formal about it, you would need to add parentheses like, uh, well, almost everywhere. Okay, but so let me again read this out loud just to give you a feeling on uh, how to, just to demonstrate that the semantics are quite natural for, for it. It's really what you would expect. So for example, this is saying that, uh, so we, it starts with the negation. So it's saying that it's not the case uh, that there exists a natural number X, Y and Z. So that uh, X is not zero uh, and Y is not zero and Z is not zero and they satisfy this equation. And again, since we are interpreting uh, addition as the standard addition of natural numbers, uh, yeah, this, this statement is true precisely because uh, Fermat's last theorem is true, which implies that equations of this form do not have uh, solutions in positive integers. Uh, okay, and then here is the third example. So let me again read it out loud. This is this is really the semantics of first logic. Even if you, I mean, if you if you look at, I mean, if you even if you do it very formally, uh, it's 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 just the semantics are just <laughs> translating this to English. It's kind of silly. So again, this would be to read it out loud. It's saying that for any natural number x either we have that x is zero or there exists a natural number y so that this x is a successor of y. In other words, uh, x equals uh, y plus uh, one because s is interpreted as the standard successor function. And again, this is indeed true because, you know, it's natural number, which is not the zero has a predecessor. Uh, yeah. All right. Okay. So we have already defined syntax and semantics. So we're in a good position here. So now I'm briefly going to discuss about first order theories. 
which is actually a very bad title because this should be about logical consequence, but we'll stick with it. So, uh, okay, so what is a first order theory? Well, it's just a set of sentences of first order logic. So think of theory as being a set of axioms, for example. So for example, uh, you can write down axioms for group in first order logic and the set of group axioms is group theory. <laughs> so, okay, so that's a theory and it's consistent uh, if you have a structure which satisfies uh, all of the members in your theory. So in other words, the axioms are not in contradiction with each other. And an important point to note here that is that the set of axioms can be infinite. Okay, but and, and okay, but in practice, it, it will be, uh, it can be infinite, but it, usually it is at least some computable set. It would be pretty bad if we could not really recognize whether something is an axiom. Okay, so, so somehow the point or what I've been trying to set up here is that we are trying to formalize what mathematicians are doing. Well, one way of thinking about what mathematicians are doing, well, they're just trying to find logical consequences uh, of, of t for various t. So for different set of axioms, they're just trying to derive logical consequences as much as possible and uh, get a, a lot of uh, publications. So, so now, what is this logical consequence? This is kind of a very important notion because it really formalizes, I think, quite successfully what uh, what lo I mean, what logical reasoning is about. So, if I have some sentence phi and some set of axioms t, then I say that phi is the logical consequences of of consequence of t. I denote it by this. If for every structure A, I have that, okay, if A satisfies all the axioms, then the structure is also going to satisfy phi. So why is this a logical consequence? Well, it's logical consequence because somehow it's saying that this, the fact that phi follows from T doesn't really depend on how we interpret the members of our vocabulary, how we interpret the non-logical part of the sentences. So, for example, if T were uh, the axioms of groups and phi is some statement uh, about groups, then this is basically just, this definition is just basically saying that, okay, uh, phi follows logically from group axioms if in every group we have that phi holds there, which is kind of, yeah, that's how it's supposed to be. So, uh, so I think this sort of captures quite well the, fear, uh, the aspect about mathematics, important aspect about mathematics, which is that when mathematicians prove theorems, they are proving it for every, uh, say, for every group, for every vector space, for every topological space, for every natural number, and so on. So it it, it shouldn't really matter how we uh, interpret this abstract structure, right? So it just somehow follows from the definitions, I guess is the punchline here. Okay. So I hope that gives you some intuition. Right. And okay, and here's a, by the way, it's an example of a first order theory which has infinitely many axioms. So these are the somewhat famous axioms of piano arithmetic. So, uh, okay, yeah. Uh, I'll just mention here that this is indeed an infinite set because this last axiom, uh, P7, we actually have infinitely many. Uh, versions of it where we replace. So this phi is basically a parameter 
uh, it's a first order sentence uh, over the vocabulary of arithmetic. And this is basically capturing induction. So this, sent this sentence is, uh, well, now it's just a string, but the, it has a clear intended meaning, which is that, uh, okay, let's say I know that phi uh, is true. Is a, okay, let's say that zero has the property phi. And let's suppose furthermore that, okay, if I know that X has property phi, then I know that X plus one also has property phi. Then this uh, sentence is saying that, okay, now I know that for any X, uh, every X has the property phi. And that's basically induction principle. Uh, but somehow because uh, first of all, logic is somewhat weak, you need to have an infinite set of these. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I think I could clarify. So, so I answered that one question, which is uh, about uh, what did structure really mean? So just to, uh, I don't know, by the way, if I, okay. So by structure, uh, I mean that it's just, uh, it consists of a set and then it basically gives, uh, in, it map, interpretates uh, the members of the vocabulary uh, as, okay, so for example, function symbols will be interpreted as functions, uh, as real proper functions over, over this set. Okay, and constants will be interpreted as single elements. You can think about them as names, basically. Okay, but okay, but it uh, on the other hand, it doesn't really. It's not uh, a problem if if it somehow this concept of structure seems uh, unclear. You can just think about the standard structure of natural numbers, which is just the set of natural numbers with addition, multiplication, successor function, and zero. So. Just keep that in mind, and it, uh, because we will not really need this general notion of structure. It was only needed to really define this logical consequence. Okay. So what we have now done is that we have defined uh, we have defined this formal language first to a logic. We have defined what truth means or true means, and we have basically given perhaps we have drawn some light on the notion of logical consequence. So now we can move on to the last part that we need to formalize, which is the, so we were talking about deductions and proofs and so on. So let's try to make that a little less vague. So we'll start with the notion of proof system. Uh, and okay, I'm gonna look at it from a very high level point of view, but you can think about proof system as being some nice collection of formal rules, uh, which allow us to deduce new propositions or theorems from something that we have already uh, proven or assumed previously. So basically the rules are of this form you have. So basically this is, saying that, okay, if I have proved or assumed uh, sentences phi one to phi n, then I can deduce phi. And again, as this is something that I would like to emphasize that these proof systems are somehow, uh, when you really define formally a proof system, it somehow also depends on the background logic because, well, the formal rules, involved some sentences so you need to fix what what is the logic uh, from which the sentences are coming from uh, okay so if i have, now have some proof system p then proofs are quite easy to define so they are just sequences uh, of sentences uh, which satisfy the property that each sentence that occurs in this sequence is either an assumption 
or it's something that we have derived using a rule of p from some of the sentences that occurred before it in the proof. And uh, something that I'd like to emphasize is that proofs are always finite. So it's somehow seems quite obvious, but it's also surprisingly useful property. Uh, although it's, I mean, in the field of mathematical logic, it's not entirely, I mean, there are proof systems where people use, uh, or which basically allow them to do infinite proofs. All right. Uh, okay, so the, somehow the key property of uh, proof systems uh, is that if, if somehow these formal rules are effective, uh, meaning that, uh, okay, if I fix a proof system P, then there should be a Turing machine which can check that uh, whether, uh, I mean, uh, something is an instance of this rule. So it can basically, so basically I could use that Turing machine to check whether a sequence is a valid proof in this proof system P. Uh, and what this effectiveness implies is, is a very important property of a proof systems, which is that all the proofs uh, that can be carried out using rules uh, of, of this system P can be actually enumerated by a Turing machine. Uh, and this just follows from the fact that since I can check whether a string is actually a proof, I can just enumerate all the finite strings and then for each string, check whether it's really a proof. If it is, I'll just print it. If it's not, I'll skip it. Okay. And, okay, so I'll, I'll come back to this later, but uh, before that, I want to give you one concrete example of, uh, uh, first or the deduction. So I will not explain what is happening here, but uh, this picture has, has uh, two purposes. So the first one is to give you an example. Uh, and the second one is to really demonstrate that uh, by proofs, I'm really meaning something which is purely formal. So what is happening here is in a sense, I'm just uh, it's somehow analogous to the way that, okay, I can it's purely syntactical. It's just uh, I'm playing with uh, strings here, and and this. But I say I'll say that these things that are in the in the right side are basically just indicating what rule I am using. Okay. <clears throat> and so so far I have not actually defined a, a single proof system. And the reason why I chose first of all logic is is that. In a sense, uh, if you're working with first of all logic, you don't need to define or fix any proof system. So why is this the case? Well, first of all logic has this quite uh, amazing property that uh, there are basically proof systems that can be called complete. So a complete proof system is a proof system which satisfies the following. So if I have some set of axioms T and I have some sentence phi, then if the proof system is complete, then I will have the following equivalence. So phi follows logically from T, if and only if I can deduce T, uh, sorry, phi from T. Okay. And the reason why these proof systems are called complete is uh, just that, uh, okay, first, maybe I don't, I don't want my proof systems to be able to prove something which is not a logical consequence of the set of axioms T. Uh, but, uh, okay, so that's the first thing. And secondly, okay, maybe I want them to prove at least the logical consequences of T. So in a sense, uh, these complete proof systems 
prove everything that we intuitively would expect them to be able to prove. I mean, in the sense that, okay, if you if you agree that proof systems capture logical consequence, then uh, in the case of first logic, it really is the case. Uh, and one, so what this implies, this existence of complete proof system is that it doesn't really matter what proof system we are using. Uh, prefer, I, I guess we want to use uh, some proof system which is complete. Uh, so we'll just fix one and it doesn't really matter what we fix because we know that they all prove the same, same theorems. Uh, and this is actually, I mean, if you, if you look at the literature, this is often the practice that people just, if they want to speak about uh, proofs, but they're not doing something called proof theory, then they'll just, uh, they'll never specify what the proof system is that they're working with. And another thing that should be somehow emphasized is that this completeness means that uh, syntax and semantics, you know, in a sense, correspond to each other. Because the fact that phi can be deduced from t is, is in a sense, some sense, a purely syntactical fact. So if phi can be deduced from t, then there is a witness for it, which is just a sequence of strings. And it's, it's just very, it's just syntactical, or everything is syntactical. While this notion of logical consequence is more semantical because uh, to check that phi follows from t, you have to somehow refer to the semantics of the logic, which is not the case with these uh, proof systems. So this completeness means that the syntax and semantics are the more syntactical interpretation for logical consequence and the more semantical interpretation coincide. And it's not trivial uh, because, if, for example, if you replace first order logic with something which is more expressive, like so-called second order logic, then you will lose this equivalence. And it actually follows from Gödel's uh, first incompleteness theorem. Right, so now we have everything, uh, finally. And now I can state formalist version of Goethe's first incompleteness theorem. And here it goes. So let's say I have uh, some set of axioms T, which is uh, computable and uh, consistent. Uh, so it's a set of first order sentences over the arithmetical vocabulary. Then the set of uh, first, order, first order sentences which are true in the standard structure of natural numbers is not contained in the set of uh, sentences of personal logic that can be uh, deduced from the set of axioms of T. So it's, it's uh, somewhat the same, but now we have uh, somehow given more meaning to these different notions. Uh, Okay, so there was a question whether I could provide a formal definition of truth. Uh, yeah, uh, it not really. I mean, you will find it in any standard logic book, but the formal definition is, it's, I mean, in the general form, it's, it's not that uh, simple. I mean, the basic idea is very simple, but if you state it formally, it's, uh, it's not not that easy. <clears throat> Unfortunately, I can't. Uh, yeah, it's a bit annoying. Right. Uh, okay. So <clears throat> now I'll sketch you a uh, proof for this first incompleteness theorem. So uh, let this be. So I'll two shorthand notations. So this is just the set of first order sentences which are true in the standard structure. And this is the set of first order sentences that can be deduced from T. Uh, yeah, the truth does depend on the structure. That's some other point that whether, so truth is in that sense relative. So whether a sentence is true in a structure, yeah, it, it's some of the truth is specific to a structure. So although the semantics works for any structure, uh, one sen when sentence could be true in one structure and false in another structure. 
Okay, so let's take a consistent set of, so the proof goes uh, via contradiction. So I will not give any constructive proof for it. So uh, let T be some consi consistent set of first order sentences over the arithmetical vocabulary. Uh, so, and let's assume that it's such that, okay, every sentence uh, which is true in the standard structure is uh, contained in the set of sentences that can be deduced from T. And furthermore, let's assume that this set, uh, T as a set is compatible. So there's a one big elephant in the room that I'll, I'll just skip because I just don't have I would not have had time to explain this, but the, basically what we are going to do is that we are going to provide a reduction. So it was good that we discussed reductions today. So what you can do is you can reduce uh, Turing machines into sentences of first order logic in such a way that, okay, if, so in this reduction, we map uh, Turing machine M to some, uh, first order sentence phi m over the vocabulary of arithmetic. Uh, and, and this reduction has the property that m holds uh, with the empty input, uh, if and only if uh, this sentence phi m is true in the standard structure. And this, okay, so let's just keep it, but it's, it's not, on the other hand, it's not difficult. On the other hand, it's somewhat tricky. Uh, Okay, but let's assume, assume that we have this reduction. And then what this, what this reduction actually gives us is a way to determine whether a Turing machine holds. Uh, and the reason is that we can actually just enumerate uh, members of this set uh, until we encounter either phi m or its negation. So <laughs> just to point out, since we assume that this T as a set is computable, uh, you can then, and using the, what I just said that is somehow the proofs uh, are, all the, all the proofs using some proof system are enumerable uh, by a Turing machine. Uh, combining those two, you can show that, okay, this set is something that I can enumerate also. Uh, and okay, so, two observations why this really works. So first, you know that during the enumeration, you're either going to encounter phi m or its negation, simply because of the fact that all the sentences which are true in the standard structure of natural numbers are really contained in the set of sentences that can be deduced from the set of axioms t. So because, OK, either, either the Turing machine halts, in which case this one is true and it can be deduced or it doesn't hold. So this one is true because it's saying that this is not true. Okay, and then it can be deduced. So we will eventually encounter one of them during this enumeration. And important point here is that since we assume that this set of axioms is consistent, we'll know that it doesn't contain both of them. So it, it's not possible to derive a contradiction from these axioms. So we will encounter one of them and then we know that it must be the one which is true over the true in the standard structure of natural numbers. Um, and okay, so we have a way to de determine whether the halting problem or whether a Turing machine halts. And since halting problem is uh, undecidable, we have a contradiction. So it's, I, th I think it's surprisingly simple. But yeah, the second step need, would expand a little bit the proof. Okay, uh, so I was planning to compare this to Gödel's original proof, uh, which is something that I'll just don't have the time at now. But uh, I'll still actually state the second uh, Gödel's second incompleteness theorem because. We went to, through a lot of pain to, you know, formalize uh, most of the relevant things. Uh, so we can also almost uh, state formally the Gödel's second incompleteness theorem. So it's saying that, okay, if I have some set of axioms, which is 
computable and consistent and so that it contains all the axioms of piano arithmetic uh, then this theory t cannot prove that it is uh, consistent and this last sentence is what you would need to formalize so what you would need to do is somehow write down a sentence of first order logic over the arithmetical of a library which expresses that there is no there is no proof of contradiction or so, somehow that it expresses that t cannot prove a contradiction okay and yeah it's i mean if we come back to the picture that i showed earlier it's saying that uh, yeah it's again somehow putting limits on what effective machines are able to do so for example they they really can't determine whether they are able to prove that zero is not equal to zero uh, but uh, but this is in, in some sense this second incompleteness term is much more deeper and uh, it has it i think it has some real consequences uh, on the foundations of mathematics okay uh, so that was the main part of the talk. So I'll just briefly mention two uh, things about the relevant literature. So I personally uh, based a lot of the things that I discussed here uh, on uh, on chapter ten on this book, uh, Mathematical Logic, written by Eppinghaus, Flum, and Thomas. Uh, but I would also, I mean, if you are interested in this. Uh, or you started to get interested in this, I would actually uh, direct you to this uh, excellent uh, entry written by, written by Panu Raatikainen uh, on Köhler's incompleteness theorems uh, in standard uh, Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy. So even though this is in Stan, uh, Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy, this is uh, actually a very technical entry uh, so if you really want to, you know, get to the bottom of all the technical details, then this is the place to go. Uh, but besides that, uh, it, it contains a lot of uh, very, I, I think, very good uh, references on this topic. Uh, and some quite recent ones as well. Okay, so that's it. Uh, so thanks for the, uh, thanks for your attention. I hope that you were able to get something out of this presentation. And I thought that it would be nice to end with a picture of my dog, Tuve, who tends to take life very seriously. Okay, thanks. Yeah, although uh, I'll let everyone ask some technical question, but I'm also curious how old is your dog? He looks so young. Uh, yeah, that's that's actually uh, so that this picture was taken last year, but currently she is uh, a little more than five months old, so quite young. Oh, I see. Okay. Yeah, but I, I I always crack up when he uh, when she looks at me because the mouth is. Where is the <laughs> Yeah, but based on what I look at, uh, so I did, I did somehow try to follow the chat, and it seemed that you were able to answer a lot of mm, the questions. I have a so. question. Sure. Okay, so um, I love the presentation. It's very. Really it's a very interesting topic and I loved also the approach that logic has and like it's very formal and it's a, I've never seen something like this and I wanted to ask um, what brought you to deciding to study logic in, in your PhD I mean and that I mean I kind of understood your end that branch so you you decided to follow this path what what like drives you to do that uh yeah okay so so originally uh i got interested in logic because uh, i was interested in philosophy so here here in finland we have uh, this somewhat long tradition of applying logic to 
study uh, philosophical questions. And when I started to read it, I quickly understood that I would need to uh, learn more about logic. That was ex actually the reason why I ended up studying mathematics. But actually, uh, the type of logic that I'm studying in in my PhD for my PhD is actually more related to uh, computation computational complexity theory and more precisely I'm just basically applying this uh, what I'm trying to do is to determine uh, uh, the computational complexities of uh, several computational questions that arise uh, from the study of uh, formal logics. So for example, uh, we encountered uh, during this uh, second, uh, the fir lex first lecture today, we encountered the tree sat problem. So something that I've been studying is, okay, we are going to study something which is much more stronger than tree sat and for which the complexity of the satisfiability problem is much higher. And that's that's something, for example, that I've been doing. Mm, awesome. Also, real. There's a question in the chat. Actually, uh, people asked this before, but I couldn't answer. So maybe you can take a look. Mm, okay. So it's the from Truve. Uh, yeah, the last if, one. Yeah, if each system has its own set of statements that can't be proved in the other, can I just say it to be weaker? Uh, yeah, okay, so, uh, so yeah, so there are, uh, so for example, uh, it follows from Gödel's second incompleteness theorem that piano arithmetic cannot prove that piano arithmetic is complete. But what you can do is that, okay, you, you take this sentence which expresses that piano arithmetic is uh, consistent. Uh, and then you add that sentence as an axiom. And then what you get is a new set of axioms, which is strictly stronger than the piano axioms. So yeah, the, the different, uh, so even though uh, different uh, axiom, ax uh, systems of axioms have uh, statements that they cannot prove if they're sufficiently strong, uh, there are still containments between, between these uh, systems. And this was actually something that, for example, Turing studied in his PhD thesis. So basically what he did was that he, he, he did what I just said. So he, he started with say piano arithmetic added a sentence which expresses that piano arithmetic is consistent. You have a new system you add it into it a sentence which says that the new system is consistent, then you repeat this. And you repeat this infinitely many times. And okay, if, no, if somebody knows what ordinal is, then you do this omega many times and the omega plus one times and so forth. And this is something that he studied in his PhD thesis. Okay, so I hope that uh, answered the question. Uh, okay, so Travis was asking about philosophical implications. Uh, well, I linked this uh, entry written by Panu, and I, I think it, it contains something about the philosophical implications. Uh, but uh, yeah, I don't, I don't know about the fir Gödel's first incompleteness theorem, so I, I'm not sure if it really implies anything that is that interesting in a sense. But uh, the second one, I think, is quite interesting because it, yeah, as I tried to somehow indicate, it's just demonstrating that, um, yeah, I mean, within mathematics, we cannot ever formally prove that mathematics is consistent. So, I mean, and people, but it doesn't really, on the other hand, it doesn't seem to be a problem. So people just keep on going. <laughs> and uh, I mean, in, in practice, it doesn't show up. So 
I think it. So I think that's somewhat interesting, but but definitely it implies uh, some limits on what we can know. Uh, yeah, so somebody's asking what type of statements cannot be proved. So there are more natural statements. Uh, that cannot be proved. So, for example, for piano arithmetic, uh, there is this thing called Paris Harrington theorem, which states that certain uh, a theorem from Ramsey theory cannot be proved within piano arithmetic. So, some of these undesirable statements are very concrete. Uh, and also, another example, which is <clears throat> A bit different is that uh, it's known that if you have ZFC, then it cannot prove continuum hypothesis, for example. Which is uh, so there are so the point is that there are like real mathematical uh, statements that cannot be proved in these systems. So it's not like the all the things that we cannot prove are some pathological uh, uh, statements. Uh, can you probably a little bit elaborate what you mean by non redundant? Uh, do you mean that uh, the set of axioms should be? Yeah, okay, yeah, <laughs> like I figured it out when you said it. So, uh, yeah, it, yeah, it doesn't matter if the, so the set of axioms can be dependent. So, you know, there can be dependencies between the axioms. It doesn't, doesn't matter. Uh, uh, right, so. Uh, so Mohammed is asking, saying that uh, can we still can still prove any arithmetic statement with higher order logic? So, I mean, I guess what it boils down to is what do we mean by a proof? And so, if by a proof we mean something that can be done in a proof system, uh, then no. So, I mean. If if you if you take something like a second order logic, uh, there is there is a, yeah it's it it's still there. If you so if if by proof you mean this yeah proof system formal syntactical blah blah blah. Uh, on the other hand, if you mean by proof some you know any proof, then then yeah, but. Um, uh, yeah. Yeah, I'll refer to like formal proofs. Um, so, so basically, yeah. saying if, if you're talking about formal proofs, you can't do that even with high order logic. Yeah, because somehow, somehow the point point is that uh, okay, if I have some say, uh, so if I have a okay, so let's concentrate on second order logic. So if I have a set of sentences of second order logic which is a computable set then uh, no matter what proof system i use uh, it's not possible for me to deduce all the sentences for even first order sentences which are true about natural numbers and uh, there is actually quite a simple reason for it so i didn't probably emphasize it enough but what we basically showed uh, during the proof was that the set of true sentences of natural numbers is a set which is not computably enumerable. And almost by definition, uh, anything that you can prove from a computable set of axioms written in whatever logic is a computably enumerable set always. So it's it doesn't really change anything if you increase the expressive power of your logic. And in a sense, it also makes the situation worse because you start to lose completeness. And I mean, even for second order logic, there are sentences, or I mean, second order logic can express uh, continuum hypothesis. 
So there is a sentence of second law logic which is uh, valid uh, if and only if continuum hypothesis is true. So in a sense, validity is even you know undecidable or it's not decidable within Z of C. So it, it it starts to get pretty bad. Yeah, I think. thanks. Yeah. So this was in a sense also the main motivation. I, I think it's the main motivation for Hilbert to even start uh, asking for these finitistic proofs because he somehow didn't want to, he wanted to skip all the problems that set theory was causing by just resorting to something which is mechanical, syntactical. I mean, it, it seemed to, seems to somehow to be more objective in a sense. I mean, it's uh, even 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 the semantics of second order logic somehow depend on what what is the background set theory that you are using. So yeah, it's complicated. Uh, but I, it's starting to seem that that was all of the guess, uh, questions. Yeah. So maybe let's thank uh, Ray again, and I'll stop the recording. And but uh, people can still feel free to stay and ask questions. I guess. Yeah. Thank you. Ray.